Um, but again, it's the theme is we're dealing with uh, herpetology, and this particular project is it also has some ties to Auburn. Uh, there's there's this ongoing battle about what species are and how we define species, and then and we thought we had it nailed down, and then suddenly we started to find cases, more and more cases, where we get hybrids, where we get species that are intermediates between one species and another. And one of the places that this popped up was in, in Auburn, and, they, and this was 40 years ago, and it was a really nice piece of work with, with frogs. And Andrew and I got to talking about the project, or about projects for him, and we tumbled across this, uh, this paper from Auburn, and we thought, gosh, you know, the conditions that they're talking about in Auburn that they think drove this event to the, that they hybridized, well, gosh, these species overlap an awful lot. Are we seeing the same set kinds of problems here in northeastern Alabama? And so that's what Andrew's goal is, is to take a look at these same two species but see if we're seeing problems with hybridization. So, Andrew, it's yours. Thank you, Dr. Klein. Uh, as you said, I'm Andrew Collins. Uh, my presentation is going to be on the hybridization between the Neuron Highlands and Northeastern Alabama. I uh, hope you guys are patient with me. This is my first time doing this, but I hope you guys enjoy otherwise. So, uh, there's a lot of biodiversity here in the state of Alabama. Uh, it's, it's due to because the uh, just the large amount of diversity in elevations throughout the state, the, the diversity in vegetation here. Uh, the temperatures are, are pretty consistent throughout the year, so that allows a lot of species to thrive here in many niche habitats. Um, and here we have uh, we have a lot of different species of frogs here in the state, about 30 species altogether, and. The focus of my research is going to be on the uh, highlands of Alabama. So the, if you don't know what a highland is, it's a tree frog. And if you don't know what the difference between a tree frog and a regular frog is, tree frogs have nice little sticky toe pads at the end of their hands that they can climb stuff with. And we have a lot of those species here. Uh, the two species that are the focus of my research are going to be the uh, green tree frog. And it seems like I had some kind of malfunction with my PowerPoint. My bad, guys. Uh, but the green tree frog, Hylocinaria and the barking tree frog, Hylogradiosa. So the green tree frog has a pretty large range. Uh, it covers as far west as Texas to as uh, north as North Carolina. Uh, it can even reach the southern tip of Florida. So it has a very large range and it's pretty common throughout that range. Uh, their habitats are typically permanent standing waters like ponds, lakes, maybe rivers in some cases. Uh, and the, and the way they breed is uh, the, the males typically, typically make a, a very honking sound mating call, usually perched from some type of vegetation. It kind of sounds like a, a rank, rank, rank honking sound. And then the females come in and find them and are able to kind of hone in on where those males are. Uh, in comparison, the barking tree frog has a much smaller range. As you can see, the, the, in comparison to the green tree frog, it's completely within that range. Um, barking tree frogs are a lot fatter and can are, are actually uh, distribute out into the woods a lot more than green tree frogs do. They usually like to be around uh, uh, water sources that drain a little bit more and they, uh, they like to climb very high in trees and then during the winter they'll, they'll sometimes burrow to kind of stay safe throughout the winter. Uh, their call in comparison is kind of more like a boop sound. You know, kind of like a bouncy ball or something. But uh, they, they, the way they uh, do their mating behavior is the males will go straight into the pond and, and they'll just kind of float there and call from that position and then the females can find them that way. Interestingly enough though, not only do they have overlapping ranges, they have overlapping breeding seasons as well. They both breed in the summer. So they start as early as March and will go all the way till the end of August. And as you can imagine, that kind of cause some problems here and there because sometimes they have the same habitat preferences in certain situations. So they create hybrids. These guys are hybridizing. If you don't know what hybridization is, it's when two species can produce viable offspring, two separate species. Um, 
And for, a, for the, an offspring to be viable, they have to not only survive, but they also have to reproduce as well. And notice some of these features that this guy's exhibiting. If you didn't get a look at the pictures earlier, that big white stripe on this lateral is pretty, a pretty big characteristic to identify greens with. While that, the, the pattern spots on his back are pretty typical for barker tree frogs. So he's exhibiting morphological traits from both species, from both parental species. And we can use those traits to identify them apart from their parents. So there's been a lot of studies on this, probably, I guess, over the past 60 years now, since it's 2018. Um, but back in 1960 was the first time this was observed. It was observed back in the uh, good old Auburn, Alabama, where Eagle, by the way. Um, I'm a bit biased because that's where I got my bachelor's from. But uh, this uh, behavior was first uh, identified there, and they found, he found uh, this happening in the Auburn fisheries. This guy named John Meckham found this happening. And he kind of looked at their morphology to kind of try and discern what was the best characteristics to separate the hybrids from the parents. And he also tried crossbreeding them some to see if their, uh, their, their offspring would develop okay. And he didn't really find any issues with those, that development. They're, they're the, larva, the, the larva developed just fine, and you know, they continued on just fine as their own population, practically. Um, in 1975, Oldman Gerhardt found that uh, females will selectively choose their mates among all these different species. So he, he tested a female barker and had them tested against the green tree frog call and the barker tree frog call. And they were still able to select out their own species call. So it's pretty cool. Um, unless only the green tree frog was available, and uh, if the female was stressed enough, she would still make that mistake. So under certain, uh, certain conditions, this mistake could still happen. Uh, later in 1980, Gerhardt again discovered this happening in Savannah, Georgia. So now we know that this wasn't only happening in Auburn, Alabama, but it was happening in other places in the range as well. And lo and behold, some of the similarities between these two habitats is that they were modified to a degree. They were disturbed by human hands. And that was what Megan was uh, suggesting might be the cause of this hybridization. Later in 1986, uh, Schliefer, I thought I'm saying his name right by God, uh, but uh, in 1986 he observed a lot, a much stronger reproductive isolation happening between the populations. So even though these populations were still hybridizing and sharing the same space, they were actually diverging a little bit. Barker tree frogs would start calling a little bit earlier, about two weeks earlier, and then during that overlap of the seasons, the hybrids would start calling. And then once the hybrids stopped calling, the green tree frogs would actually call for a little bit longer. So there was a bit of divergence going on there. He also came to the conclusion that the hybrids had lower survivability. So the reason for that was because the hybrids would exhibit these features from both parents, right? So they would copy the behavior of the barker tree frogs and disperse out into the woods. But the problem with that was that they couldn't retain water as well as barker tree frogs. They had, they had the same type of skin as green tree frogs and they needed water more you know, frequently, and they would desiccate really quickly when they, when they copied that behavior. So for my study, and as you can see, I'm a, kind of a maniac about frogs with my uh, bag of frogs here. Uh, but for what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to be looking to see if hybridization is even happening here in northeastern Alabama. We have a lot of interesting sites that we can look at. And I'm going to be comparing allopatric sites with sympatric sites in here in this northeast region. An allopatric site, if you don't know, is a site that only has one of the species, and a sympatric site has both of the species present. And I'm going to be using, a, uh, I'm going to be catching several individuals from each of those sites. I'm going to be running them through several types of analyses. So I'm going to be using morphological, acoustical. So I'm going to be recording their calls and comparing those between the parents and the, and the hybrids. Um, I'm also going to be looking at genetics and surface area. So me and Doc, after thinking a little bit about this uh, problem, and he suggested I should look at surface area and how that interacts with temperature. So that's going to be included in my study. And I'm going to be running through all the, these, uh, this data all through all these different types of analyses, uh, univariate, multivariate, 
principal component, you name it. <coughs> so this is my main St. Patrick's site. Uh, site. This is uh, Frog Pond. And this is a, not only a site for both greens and, and barkers, it's a site for many, many different types of frog species. Uh, we had some problems with this site last year due to the enormous drought that we went through, and, and it really knocked all the amphibians down a peg. I'm, I'm sure you heard the horror stories from some of our other graduate students. Um, but it's looking much better now. It's, uh, this was a, taken last week, a nice little panoramic shot. And the water's coming back, and it's been raining a lot, so we're, looking, we're, we're hoping for some good turnout this next summer. For my morphological analysis, I'm going to be using five main characters. Oh, no, no. Uh, forget that, six. The sixth one's kind of iffy, though. Um, the main five I'm going to be using are tibia fibula link, uh, forearm link, snout to vent link, uh, head width, and ankle to toe link. And then we're also thinking about using sacral humps as another measurement, but that one's been a little iffy to, to mess with. Uh, Mecham himself uh, suggested using both the tibia fibula head width and south of bent length because they were probably the best characters. But I want to include stuff like forearm length because that might have something to do with the success for green tree frogs to actually mate with barker tree frogs because if you think about it, green tree frogs are a lot smaller and petite. Those barker tree frogs are real big and fat. You have to have some pretty long arms. <laughs> so, I wasn't able to get a whole lot of data last year due to that drought, but I was able to get some good data from one of my Allopatric sites. Um, and this is just for green tree frogs and their data. Uh, so from the site here, I was able to compare it with data I took from uh, Auburn's, Auburn University's uh, inventory. So they have a huge and wonderful inventory on many species. And I was thankful, uh, thankfully to them, I was able to borrow a lot of data from them and compare that. And here we can see that the L. Patrick data here is pretty, pretty good. Uh, it's pretty, it's, it's very consistent and correlates really strongly all across the board with all, all those characteristics. So it's pretty trustworthy to, to use that data, I believe. This is even including data from tree frogs found outside of the Barker range. So. One minute. Yes. One minute. Uh, general data. So. I also wanted to compare the tree frog data with uh, uh, data from other species in uh, Auburn's inventory. So I could actually use green tree frog data, barker tree frog data, and hybrid data. And we can actually see the actual comparisons between all of them. And it pretty much matches up. Green tree frog data was uh, consistently smaller, while the barker tree frog data was consistently larger. And then the hybrids were always a little bit in the middle. So that was pretty consistent. It turned out pretty well for a very simple calculation so far. I'm also going to be doing acoustics. Uh, we can look at uh, calls between the two species and pick out pulse repetition rates and compare those together and pick out the hybrids from, those, uh, from the data taken from that information. And I'm also going to be looking at genetics in surface area, of course. So in genetics, we're going to be using uh, PCR techniques instead of the old electrophoresis techniques that have been used in previous studies. And then, of course, we're going to be using surface area. I just want to see how that interacts with temperature, and because previous studies have shown that uh, temperature does affect uh, mating call selection in fruit and tree frogs. Future prospects, if uh, this is happening, if hybridization is actually happening here, um, I want to see how that compares Two previous studies. If we're, if why, why they may have be having more success or less success, I want to do maybe like a small population survey, get an idea of what's going on there. And if it's not, I want to see what's isolating those organisms. Is it call preferences? Is it have to do the habitat modification, being there or not being there, or is it some other thing? Does it have to, have to do something with temperature or any other number of factors? I want to find that out, and we can really figure out this uh, interesting little mystery. So I just want to thank everyone from the biology department. Uh, they've really supported me big time. Uh, Dr. Klein, uh, all, the, all the grad students have gone out with me and just helped grab frogs out of the water. <laughs> uh, and everyone else has just been supporting me this whole time. Uh, my parents, of course. Uh, Dr. Murdoch, obviously, he's going to be helping me out a lot. 
Um, but if anyone has any questions, feel free um, to throw them at me. Any questions? I'm not sure we'd have any math majors if we had to help each other grab frogs out of the water. <laughs> 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 I 